Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. I hope you all have this program with you. If you don't have it, Sue Harkins will bring it to you. Thank you very much. Please take a program. <clears throat> At the outset, it is my duty to and extend my gratitude to Dr. Christopher Dougherty for your steadfast support in our lecture series, biomedical lecture series. Chris, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your great support. You were always there for me when I walked into your office. On behalf of President Latimer and the college community, I wish you all success as you take the prestigious role as president of Madonna University. The college will always be part of your great memory that you will cherish. So again, on behalf of President Latimer and chair of the board of the Mrs. Kathy Lockyer Moulton, please accept a small token of appreciation and would you please come forward. Chris, would you, when you, after you settle in, if you have a faculty position, please let me know. <laughs> Dr. Mark Meacham, thank you for stepping up as our interim vice president and also as dean of the faculty, uh, dean of faculty and school of, uh, dean of, uh, school of admissions, undergraduates and you are taking multiple hats, you are putting on multiple hats, and we thank you for stepping up during this time. You both are true gentlemen. Thank you very much. And if you need any uh, opening in the dean's office, you can find a volunteer. <laughs> and you are seeing me. And I'm a loyal servant to this college. Sue Harkins, again, thank you for doing all the things. Faith keller Moyer, thank you for putting this beautiful biomedical program I have some quick announcements before I bring our president to the stage. As we all know, parking is a very serious problem everywhere in the United States. And uh, some of you came to me, no worries, you, will have, you won't get the ticket. Having been in Manhattan with my husband for a number of years, the only marital issue my husband and Michael had was where to park the car. How to park the car, where to fit the car, whether the car will fit in or not. Bill, you know about that. So I will say yes, he will say no. He will say yes, I will say no. The tension in the car was big. And you know, that is our marital status. But I always, as you know, he is the king of the castle. I said, Michael, whatever you say, you are right. Go ahead and park wherever you want. Guess what? He ended up parking in Cincinnati. <laughs> but this is not Manhattan. This is... <laughs> This is Philadelphia and a beautiful college. Our security is aware of your presence. They are not going to give you a ticket. And if you do get the ticket, I will use my mighty power to get you off the hook. It's only for today, only within the grounds, not outside. Please don't ask me. <laughs> Thank you, Officer Politetti. <clears throat> At the end of the keynote lecture, there is a microphone in the front, please, in the center, please come to the aisle so your voice will be heard and if you want to ask the question, please. If you are a first timer, we are very happy you are with us. If you are a second timer, we are happy you are back with us. If you are an all timer, we are happy you are stuck with us. This is because I'll tell you, this is like no other place. There is a lot of love, peace and appreciation and I truly call this my second home. So if you want to be here and call it a second home, be stuck here. On that high note, I want to introduce, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our president of Chestnut Hill College, Dr. William Latimer, who will give a few welcome remarks. Would you please join me to welcome Dr. William Latimer. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
thank you to Lakshmi. And to start by really acknowledging uh, the immense wonderfulness of Lakshmi and what she brings to this college and organizing uh, this incredible speaker series completely more or less on her own and bringing in such amazing speakers like Joe Cachon uh, from Jefferson University. So let's, let's, let's thank Lakshmi. So a lot of great stories in this room. I'm gonna just share a couple. Um, Lakshmi's husband's here, and I believe he works at Penn, but not a pretty good school. So glad that he's here. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, a former student of Lakshmi's here who uh, has uh, identified that he made uh, a path uh, in medical school, right? To medical school. And a critical moment in his educational experience was when he took a course with Lakshmi some time ago. Am I close? Yeah, completely right. All right, I'm completely right, good. That's, that's the first time I've heard that in at least six months. Uh, so that's also great. We got Ken Soprano here, who's about to become emeritus faculty. We have our board chair, Kathy Lockyer-Multan. We've got another board member, uh, Mike and Jean Fitzpatrick are here. Um, and of course, most importantly, we have here our CHC students that can benefit from this great lecture and this great series. David Contasta is here, master of history. Whenever I need to know anything about Chestnut Hill and or a region within 50 miles or 100 miles or planetary, I go to David and he tells me and, and that's very helpful. Look, Lakshmi is 100% correct. This is, this is the best small private and best small private Catholic college in Pennsylvania and as far as I'm concerned, the country and the world. And do I see Sister Rita there too? There you go, Sister Rita, another legend. Let's give Sister Rita a round of applause. <laughs> Sister Rita is another person that I turn to whenever I want to understand history and current events, quite frankly. Um, so. We are so uh, happy to have Joe Cachon here as our uh, keynote speaker of this great series. Joe and I just uh, had a nice conversation. 98% uh, of what we discussed was private, so I can't share any of it now. I, I will simply say that we, uh, I think, uh, and I'll, he'll speak for himself, we at Chestnut Hill stand ready to partner with Jefferson uh, on multiple fronts. And I think there's a lot of things we can do together uh, that would be very exciting for both uh, institutions. So with that, uh, welcome to everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to Joe, and I will turn it over to Joe Cashone. Thank you so much. <laughs> or another esteemed faculty member, another Joe. All right, welcome everyone. President Bill Latimer, Vice President Mark Meacham, faculty, staff, students, guests, and especially our featured speaker, Dr. Joseph Cachon. A warm welcome to Chestnut Hill College, Dr. Cachon. It's really great to have a Jeffersonian amongst our uh, audience with, uh, today. First, I wanna say that this introduction was not written by chat GPT, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, Lakshmi, happy anniversary on your 30 years of this remarkable seminar series, certainly deserving a trumpet fanfare. <laughs> This in tribute to your efforts arranging an informative lecture presentation every semester, every semester since 1993. That's remarkable, that's really remarkable. I obviously can't speak to all of the 60 lectures, uh, but it dawned on me that the college is very close to celebrating its 100th anniversary of its founding. And it's remarkable that your series spanned a 30-year history 
which has been an exemplary part of the life of this great institution. So I want to take you on a travel through time, and so I'm going to briefly be your tour guide this afternoon. So before I show the next slide, can I have a raise of hands of those who have served this institution since uh, before 19, uh, 2003? Raise of hands if you were here before 2003. Sister Rita, okay, <laughs> Dave, okay, we, I think we've hit all of them. All right, so here you go. We're going to take you back. This next photo that's going to float in will bring back memories to you. And for the rest of us here beyond 2003, we'll provide a sense of where the college was and where we are here today. This is before the college went co-ed. This next slide illustrates the great opportunity uh, that students had personally meeting and with speakers one-on-one -on -one that were nationally and internationally recognized professionals, the brightest and the best in their fields of expertise, clinicians, research scientists, CEOs, and three Nobel Prize recipients, all gracing us with very distinct and timely lectures. This next image is going to be remarkable. It illustrates the remarkable diversity of students incoming when the college went co-ed in 2003. It was truly a remarkable transformation for the college. As I look at this, you might think it's all students. I don't think Dr. McKern is here today, but a few of us were about 20 years younger then. So there's Dr. Lisa McKern, who has since retired. Uh, there's Lakshmi Atchison. She looks just like, this, like she does today. And there's me and Dr. Robert uh, Meyer. Dr. Latimer, your presentation last week to faculty and staff pretends great expect expectations of even greater transformational events uh, for this college in the near future. As mentioned earlier, highlighting six, 60, spe uh, six, 60 spe speakers and their lectures today is impractical. I settled on one that was a bit of an outlier on the topic of uh, challenges in equine orthopedics presented by Dean Richardson doctor of veterinary medicine from the University of Pennsylvania, who was the last specialist to care for the Kentucky Derby winner, Barbro, for those of you who remember the horse, the racehorse Barbro, who was expected to win the Triple Crown, but unfortunately had a severe injury during the Preakness race. However, this image is stunning, is a stunning visual example of the uh, lecture audience that it fills a room uh, year after year, semester after semester. So Lakshmi, thank you so much for lining up such a wonderful diversity of speakers over these past 30 years. But wait, there's a secret accomplice behind the scenes. There they are, the dynamic duo, <laughs> Dr. Lakshmi Atchison and Dr. Michael Atchison. Dr. Michael Atchison, or Mike, was pivotal in connecting uh, many speakers for the, the seminar series, especially from the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you, Michael, for all you've done for this college. But today, we're honored to have the presence of Dr. Kishon, CEO of Thomas Jefferson University, a ubiquitous and truly revered institution in the tri-state area. Dr. Kishon, my eight years at, in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Jefferson was absolutely wonderful and productive. Jefferson provided a state-of-the-art facility to conduct AIDS research, and placed at our disposal all the necessary clinical services and personnel to conduct high-profile research toward the compassionate treatment and care of HIV-infected patients. So I thank, thank Jefferson for that. The moment has come. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Atchison to the podium to introduce Dr. Kishon. Lakshmi, before you come to the podium to introduce Dr. Kishon, Please allow me to uh, give you this brief tribute. Dearest Lakshmi, and this is from the heart, Lakshmi, thank you for your hard work, your positive attitude, your willingness to sacrifice your peace of mind. Thank you for being that beaming smile that brings joy and cheer to everyone you meet. Thank you for who you are and all the prestige, prestige your biomedical seminar series has brought to Chesnail College. Thank you so much, Lakshmi.
Thank you, Dr. Latimer. Thank you, Mrs. Kathy Lockyer Moulton, our distinguished guest, Dr. Joseph Cashel, and Ms. Dominic, and all the distinguished guests, my friends, from long time, we are all here. I will come and give you a hug after the lecture. Thank you all for coming. Today is a very special day. A special speaker with us to celebrate the milestone celebration. Dr. Joseph Cashon graciously accepted my invitation. He will take the coveted spot as our 30th annual keynote speaker. I am so grateful for your presence, Joe. Thank you. <clears throat> the lecture series has been a rewarding and a humbling experience for me. Our speaker series includes professionals of very high caliber, including three Nobel laureates. They all graciously accepted my invitation, generously spent the entire afternoon with students, faculty, and staff, and offering their keynote without an honorarium. I am totally humbled and honored. Our students are fortunate to receive a lifetime opportunity to meet our professionals. Some students have done internships, published papers in cutting-edge journals, shadowed doctors. And these speakers have come from north to south, east to west, and as far away as from Germany, putting the Chestnut Hill College on global map. I owe them all my great, deep gratitude. Included in this distinguished lecture series are eight elite speakers from Thomas Jefferson University. I owe my great, deep gratitude to Dr. Charlie Yeo, who recognized the magnitude and caliber of our speaker series and introduced me to all these professionals, including former president of Jefferson and CEO of Dr. Stephen Clasco, and of course, today's speaker was introduced to me by Dr. Charlie Yeo, and also many others who are listed in this uh, slide. Because of the generous participation of these elite speakers, we have established a very strong connection between our two institutions. It is my dream and hope that our two institutions will develop stronger connections going forward. I am always grateful to Dr. Charlie Yeo he was our 19th annual keynote speaker on pancreatic cancer. His presence made a great impact on the college community. He also took care of two of our own community members and extended the quality of their life. You will also see Dr. Yeo on page four of your program. Last week, Dr. Stephen Klosko wrote, sent me a special message, and he says Dr. Kachon will be incredibly appropriate addition to this important program, Stephen Klasko. And he, he was our 26th annual keynote speaker just before the pandemic, and his presence is still palpable. Dr. Kechon, we also have connection with Jefferson with our three plus two program and four two articulation agreement with three, three of our outstanding medical students who are here and they deserve to be recognized. Jade Wilson. Jade was our first highly successful three plus two program student. Jade was also able to get two undergraduate degrees, one in biology from Chestnut Hill College and a medical laboratory science biotechnology, MLSB from Jefferson. Jade also received a master's degree from ML, in MLSB all within five years. Jade tells me that she thoroughly enjoyed the CHC Jefferson joint schooling that prepared her well for the hospital, for research, and for medical education. Jade is now a second year MD PhD student at Temple University. Last month, Jade passed her step, step one board exam. And way to go, Jade. Congratulations. Jade, would you please stand to be recognized? In 2016, Victor Diaz, a gifted high school student and archdiocese scholar from La Salle, took a college course with me on biology of cancer. Victor grew up in Chestnut Hill Gravers Lane. Bill, does it ring bell? <laughs> he was top in the class. I knew at that time he had a very promising career, future. I have not met Victor for seven years until today, 
Just four days ago, the college website, as you see in here, in the slide, college website sent me, he is contacting me. To my surprise, it was Victor Diaz. His email was heartwarming and gratifying to see that my cancer course change, changed his trajectory to switch to medical science. Today, Victor is a third year medical student. He went to University of Penn, got his undergraduate, and now a third year medical school student at Jefferson. I invited Victor right away, and he said, I'm clearing my calendar, I'm coming. And then he was gracious to come today. What a pleasure to have you, with Victor, with us. You will meet our, your CEO of Jefferson today. <laughs> and it's a small world, we are going to come together. Please welcome and recognize Victor Diaz. Why is it not lighting up all the other uh, materials about Aisha? Dr. Aisha Gayas, I had a whole story about her here. She took all the alphabets and put it in her name. She has got so many degrees, 14 alphabets, left nothing for me. She is our successful alum. Aisha was trained and worked at Jefferson Northeast for 11 years and also worked in ICU in internal medicine and interventional radiology as physician assistant. As Aisha's deepest passion is to become a leading physician in pulmonary critical care, it was truly God's calling that she served during the pandemic at Jefferson Health in preliminary pulmonary critical care. Dr. Gayas was in the front line in 2020, treating patients dying from COVID-19. While people were running away from COVID patients, she ran toward them. And she held their hands while they were dying. She risked her own life when there was no vaccine at that time. You all remember that? We have witnessed that. This is a true testament of her loyalty to humanity and willingness to sacrifice her life. As I said, Aisha's dream is to become a fellow, get a fellowship in pulmonary medicine and become a leading physician in pulmonary critical care. With God's help, anything is possible. With Dr. Keshon's help, anything is possible. And the door will open for her at Jefferson. Aisha came all the, fame, all the way from New York to be here. We can all feel proud about this alumna. Dr. Gayas, also a Jefferson employee. You can also see Aisha in the back cover of the program. Aisha, please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Dr. Kechon, again, we have a strong connection with Jefferson, not only with all these leading speakers, but also our outstanding medical students. And I hope this bond will continue for years to come and there will be a strong connection between our two institutions. Now students, why do you think Dr. Kechon is your role model? I can give top 12 reasons. Here we go. Just like you are now at Chestnut Hill College, Dr. Kechon did his bachelor's degree from Gannon University Erie, Pennsylvania, with distinction, magna cum laude. Great start. He went on to get his medical degree from Hahnemann University, Drexel, Pennsylvania, with distinction, graduate award for overall academic excellence, Alpha Omega Alpha. Then he went on to do his internship, residency and fellowship in internal medicine, Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland, Ohio. Then he went on to do clinical cardiology fellowship, University of Rochester, Strong Memorial Hospital. It is interesting that early on in his career, Dr. Keshon received his executive certificate program from University of Chicago, Graduate School of Business, Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Keshon's specialty is cardiology, coronary artery disease, heart rhythm disorders, and heart, heart failure, subspecialty adult congenital heart disease, interventional cardiology. For the first 20 years in his career, he did his private practice as a cardiologist and became an executive of a large private physician practice, <coughs> practice, a physician practice. needless to say, he was a five-star physician. He also worked at St. Vincent's Health System in Erie, Pennsylvania, 
as executive vice president and chief of quality and operations in the development of several <coughs> service lines, including orthopedics, oncology, neuroscience, and cardiovascular. He also worked for eight years in Cleveland Clinic, a leading academic medical center that integrates clinical and hospital care with research and education. He played a major enterprise role in business development and served as chairman of operations and strategy for its Heart and Vascular Institute. Dr. Kechon held numerous leadership roles on a national level on, in, and in Pennsylvania for the American College of Cardiology. He also he has served on a number of national and community-based administrative health committees along with hundreds of professional society memberships, including fellow of American College of Cardiology. He, he holds active medical licenses in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. He is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine, subspecialty, cardiovascular disease, and from 1988 to this date, he indefinitely holds and certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Kechon served as CEO of Ascension Michigan and then served as Executive Vice President, Clinical ne Network Service, District of Columbia Ascension Health. This is one of the largest private healthcare system ranked second in the United States by number of hospitals. And Dr. Kechon led a $28 billion organization with 165,000 employees across 145 hospitals and 2,600 care sites and 19 states. I am humbled to see the extraordinary work you have done there. Ascension mission statement is shown on this slide. You can read that. Beautiful. It was founded as a nonprofit Catholic healthcare network in 1999, according to Wikipedia. Therefore, over the course of 30 years of superb career, Dr. Kachon has held numerous leadership roles. He was also a principal investigator of many research grants. He has authored and co-authored <coughs> hundreds of scholarly papers, presented at national conferences and meetings on healthcare systems, new paradigms in healthcare, cardiology, and cardiovascular disease. There is a huge list, which I did not include here, due to time constraint, my apologies. Last year, Dr. Kachon was appointed as the CEO of Jefferson, Jefferson Health. TJU is one of the top ranked health sciences universities in the nation, the academic health center, and one of the leading NCI designated cancer centers integrated as two arms of the same organization. Maybe 18 hospitals or more, my, I may be wrong, 5.9 billion or maybe more dollars, I don't know. I can only count up to $100. And 5.9 billion in revenue, 50 outpatient and urgent care centers, leading rehabilitation and post-acute facilities, more than 39,000 employees. We congratulate you on this most prestigious position, Dr. Kachon. So students, as you see, Dr. Kachon is your true role model. If you want to succeed in your career, you must set your goal, set the bar high, stay the course, and you too can succeed. However, nothing comes overnight. I am deeply grateful to you, Dr. Kechon, for coming to Chestnut Hill College. What an honor for me to, for you that accepted my invitation amidst your busy, extraordinary schedules. I am grateful for your presence and taking this coveted position Please convey my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to Dr. Charlie Yeo for making my dream come true. And thank you for meeting with our president and made my dream come true. You have a red carpet welcome to come to Chestnut Hill College. On behalf of our president, Dr. Latimer, and our chair, board, uh, Mrs. Kathy Lockyer Moulton, and on behalf of college community, we welcome you to Chestnut Hill College. Dr. Kachon, this is a very timely topic you have taken, health care, uh, which touches everybody. In our Eastern culture, we honor and respect a person when we bring the person to the stage. Dr. Gayas, Aisha, and I know how it is done. We respect you with a garland and when you come to the stage. And our president will honor you with a certificate and 
a token of appreciation. And Dustin Backer, would you please come forward? And Dr. Kechon, would you please come to the stage? There you have it. Please welcome, and with a round of applause, the 30th annual keynote speaker, Dr. Joseph Cashew. Quite the introduction, and thank you very much. Um, I don't think my uh, my mom or dad could have done a better job on that introduction. So, <laughs> thank you very much, and it's uh, it's honestly uh, the pleasure is all mine to be here today. And um, you know, uh, this is a uh, <clears throat> a great series. I'm I'm humbled by the list of speakers that have been here previously and uh, Nobel laureates, and it's a real tribute to, to you, Dr. Atchison. Um, it is a tr true tribute to your, um, your leadership, your scientific inquiry, and uh, frankly, just being a great person. Uh, so thank you. Um, you know, I, again, privileged to be here today. Um, I have the privilege to being the CEO of Jefferson uh, Health and Jefferson University. And now uh, you'll hear more about what Jefferson is today and what it was in the past. It has um, been a part of the Philadelphia community for, we'll celebrate our 200 year anniversary in 2024. And uh, will be a big celebration for us. And, um, and we have lots of events planned and uh, are very excited about that. And Jefferson has become a much bigger organization today than it was when I was in medical school in uh, Philadelphia uh, a long time ago. I'll just leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the mission of Jefferson really holds true today. And, uh, and, and um, it's simply a very simple one, and that's improving lives of those we serve. Um, I have a history, uh, and my history dates back, um, and I will say that to uh, close the loop, and it feels like a small degree of separation, my first Grade school was uh, was Blessed Sacrament School in, in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. Our uh, the, the sisters that taught me there were the Sisters of Saint Joseph. Um, the sponsoring organ, the hospital that I first hospital I worked in, Saint Vincent Hospital was a the sponsoring organization was the Sisters of Saint Joseph. Uh, I feel like the sisters helped raise me and helped get me to where I am today. Um, and uh, frankly. When I went to Ascension, the two, the two major sponsoring organizations were uh, the Daughters of Charity and the Sisters of St. Joseph. So they keep coming up in my life. They've had a major influence in my life. And I think when you look at the history of the sisters and the sacrifices that they made, their health care ministry, their ministry of education, all these things come together. And I feel uh, really overwhelmed by the fact that I'm here today speaking again and have the Sisters of St. Joseph showing up in my life again and the influence that they've had. And that comes back to what the Sisters had, and it's about improving lives. And so when I interviewed for this job, you know, over a year ago now and started here in September, uh, the mission really rang true to me because it's back to my roots. It's about improving lives. And as you think about your own self to the students in the room, you know, what, what wakes me up every day and what makes my life uh, more rewarding is I doing what I love and you have to do what you love uh, and um, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of where healthcare is today and what are the headwinds and things like that and where Jefferson fits into it but to the students um, uh, people people say to me oh, are, you, are you do you tell kids today to go into medicine absolutely it's a great field uh, healthcare in general and it doesn't mean you have to be a practicing physician it can be a researcher it could be a nurse, it could be a, 
uh, al uh, respiratory therapists, a physical therapist, but that reward for helping people and improving people's lives really makes a huge difference and it, 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 it's what drives me every day. So, you know, Jefferson, um, as I say, the mission has been, is really about helping and really improving people's lives. It's uh, now become a bigger organization. Uh, it is now has different uh, parts of it and includes education. Thomas Jefferson University has always been an educator, but now Philadelphia University is now part of Thomas Jefferson University. And uh, we now have a health plan, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. And values of everything you do are really help what guide you on a day-to-day -day basis, because I will tell you, and the, the president will tell you, the day-to-day -day sometimes feels like a, a teeth-mashing event, uh, but what guides you every day are not only the values of the organization, but your own values. So how did Jefferson start? As I said, we celebrate our 200-year anniversary in, uh, in uh, next year. Uh, and uh, again, we'll have a big celebration. The, the, the hospital was started in uh, 1877. Um, if you've ever want to, as a medical student, you have the opportunity to go down and look at the archives. Um, it's remarkable in just 200 years how technology has changed. You see the great celebration of technology in this community with medical education and medicine and research at University of Pennsylvania, at Thomas Jefferson University, at Temple. Um, that scientific endeavor and scientific inquiry has really helped make Philadelphia one of the seats of healthcare, and we're proud that Jefferson is part of that Philadelphia community. Jefferson has changed a lot under my predecessor in 2014. You know, Jefferson went on a, a, a real growth spurt, and we now have 18 hospitals in our system. We're actually $10.5 billion. Uh, we have uh, Philadelphia University, now all part of Thomas Jefferson University. And we have uh, a third entity uh, called Health Partners Plan, which is a large insurance plan, which is over 500, almost 500,000 lives in that health plan. So that's an important part of where we are. We're the second largest employer in the city of Philadelphia. Um, we also have so around 42,000 employees, 9,300 nurses, 4,600 credentialed physicians, 1,800 faculty members. We see a lot of patients. We're actually the largest health system uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the area uh, today. Uh, again, as I mentioned, Jefferson as an enterprise um, is, uh, has, has grown quite a bit. And you can see the three arms of Jefferson uh, Health Partners Plan. Uh, is about 20 to 25 percent of what Jefferson is today in terms of revenue. Health Jefferson Health is about 70 percent. The university is about 7 percent. Um, and so we're, we are still finding our way on how to fit all these pieces together, and we'll talk about that toward the end of the lecture of fitting this all together. But we're now a $10, 10 billion dollar organization uh, and a vibrant part of this community, and we'll continue to grow into the community. Today in healthcare, there's a lot of headwinds and tailwinds. These aren't just unique to Jefferson. Some of the things that we'll talk about are a little bit unique, but there are headwinds and tailwinds uh, today, and I will tell you the headwinds are really strong. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, healthcare has been ever, forever changed. And for those of you who live and work in healthcare, are part of healthcare, or related to healthcare at all, you've seen how much it's changed over the last five years, in particular the last three years. You know, at one time, my prior organization, we had 8% of all inpatient COVID patients were in one of our hospitals at Ascension. It was a daunting task. We were, and um, I will tell you, we lost about 38 employees to COVID uh, during that time. Um, so it was a challenging time in healthcare, uh, and I think so many of our workers are burned out. Um, and, and coming out of that, People were hoping that we would just wave the hand, we'd be out of COVID, and we're not. And the lingering effects, the stubbornness of all the things that impacted the finances of healthcare organizations, the operations of healthcare organizations, the staffing have, can, have persisted. And it has made healthcare today, as I've been in healthcare now a long time, I'll say 30 years uh, since I, almost 40, almost 40 years since I graduated medical school. And I've not seen the, the, um, 
the impact on health care uh, that we've seen today uh, to the negative. Most of the things in health care prior to this were very positive. I mean, you think of things that changed the lives of people in health care, vaccine technology, you know, when penicillin, vaccine technology, the advent of Medicare, uh, and things like that. These were all positive things in health care. We have not seen this negative hurdle to get over on health care like we have uh, in the last uh, three years. So the other things that are impacting are not so bad, but they are definitely a change for us that have lived in the healthcare organization. Many of you young people embrace a lot of these things. For us old folks, um, we were talking about chat GPT today and I referenced to, to Joe. Um, you know, honestly, it scares the daylights out of me. I know many of you are probably excited about it, but it scares the daylights out of me uh, because there was a movie, you guys don't remember, for the young people, go back and rent a movie, probably not on the v VCR, uh, but go back and rent a movie called War Games. And that's what anchors, um, what anchors uh, us older folks about what uh, AI does and can do. So tech and te technology and scientific innovation are gonna lead the way for healthcare. And then it's changing so rapidly with the advent of artificial intelligence. In fact, today as a radiologist, in many ways are going to, could be replaced by artificial intelligence reading x-rays. There was a study in science, um, obviously a very uh, high level scientific magazine about interpreting mammograms, but done by a radiologist and done by uh, AI. And actually the AI was, uh, was actually more accurate than the radiologist. Um, so these are things that are changing very quickly. And as AI accelerates, we're gonna see more and more changes in healthcare. And so we have to embrace technology. We have to invade and, and continue to foster innovation. Um, you know, the, the vaccine technology developed at, at Penn uh, really helped lead us out of the pandemic, uh, the mRNA technology. That mRNA technology will be enormous in the treatment of cancer and other immunotherapies in the future. You're gonna see immune therapy and innovation just change how we treat people. The fact that the gene sequence has been coded today is gonna to change how we treat people with hypertension. We're gonna say, you have hypertension, we have your gene profile, we know that you are gonna to respond to this medicine. So pharmacogenetics is gonna change. Oncogenetics is gonna change how we treat cancer. Uh, in my business, cardiac, we now know we can predict based on a genotype we can predict whose aorta is going to fail and, and, and in what time frame. Um, these are things that are happening very quickly. So innovation. Consumerization is, I think, one of the biggest disruptors we have. Um, today, when you want to make a reservation for dinner, what do you do? Right to, um, what do they call it? Uh, what is it? Open table. I have it on my phone. Uh, and, you know, the expectation is I never have to... I never have to call a restaurant ever again. I can just put in my restaurant, put in what time I want to be there, how many people, and you never have to talk to the restaurant. Now, frankly, folks, I still call most of the time. Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to sound like a dinosaur or that old guy up there talking about it. It's crazy. I still value personal and interact and personal and relational things. And I think for the younger people in the room, I think a healthy balance between technology and and, and relational, uh, being relational is gonna be healthier for you in the long run. But the, the point of this story is that consumers have an expectation. They can schedule where they're gonna eat dinner at seven o'clock, but yet they ch are challenged to schedule an appointment to see Dr. Cachon in his office at noon on Friday because the, the technology just hasn't caught up. And the expectation also is most health systems today were designed frankly, for doctors. Uh, convenience for the physician. The physicians in the room may know that. Uh, they were designed for the convenience of me. Uh, and today, we're changing that. They're designed to improve the consumer experience. We have to have an end-to-end -end consumer experience that is so good that it makes us different. And that's what we'll be working on at Jefferson. We're shifting sites of care, one of the fastest growing places today is that it was really ushered in uh, by uh, the pandemic. Most, a lot of things that were previously done on an inpatient basis are now done outpatient. 
Some people are even doing the thing called hospital home. You have a deep vein thrombosis or a clot in your leg. You're not treated in the hospital any longer. That used to be a five-day stay in the hospital. Now we actually have a nurse go out to your house, and we treat you on an inpatient basis in your home. And you know what? The customer satisfaction or the patient satisfaction is enormous. The more we can do in the home, people have an expectation. They want to stay home. They don't want to be in a building. They don't want to be in the hospital. And frankly, hospitals aren't always a safe place to be. So we're working that out. The workforce is going to be continue, a continued problem. Uh, we have nurses that are burnt out. We have physical therapists, occupational therapists, doctors that are burned out from the pandemic. Um, you know, I'll tell you a story about physicians and, and nurses. What's always happened when you had a bad day at the office, and as a cardiologist, I saw a lot of life and death situations. When I went home at night, it was compartmentalized. I left it at the office. During COVID, healthcare personnel, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, they could not compartmentalize it. When they went home, they were still dealing with COVID. They were afraid for their families. They were afraid they were gonna bring COVID into the home. And so there was no ability to compartmentalize. And that's why you see healthcare organization or healthcare personnel so burned out today. We've lost over 15,000 nurses in this country uh, that have just retired and said, I've had enough. And so on the healthcare side, we have to be more flexible. We have to create a better environment for our healthcare personnel to work. We have to think about things differently. We have to be more creative. And we're working on that at Jefferson now to create a better environment of care for our staff, a bit more flexibility. People will have different expectations. I mean, what we're up against today is Google saying, hey, Joe, you want to work for us? You can stay at home, work in your pajamas. Put your, pajama, put your jammies on and sit there and, and work from your kitchen table. Uh, and, and that's a challenge because we can't do that in nursing. We can't do that in medicine. You have to be there. And so that's going to be a challenge for us. And then the last thing, and this is so important, there are too many people. This is the greatest country in the world for health care. And you can read all the statistics you want about infant mortality and everything, and there are different ways to measure that. But if somebody is sick, and I have a lot of international experience with healthcare, I've been to the Middle East, I've been to the Far East, I've been all over the world in healthcare. When people get sick in the world, you know where they come first? They come here, they come to the US. It's the best place in the world to get care when you are really sick. The problem is we're leaving too many people behind. And so health equity is going to be extremely important. And you'll see us starting to collect more and more information on health equity and starting to collect more data on social determinants of health. The, the, the marriage between your social or your zip code should not be a factor of what your mortality rate is or what, your, uh, you know, what, what age you might live to. Your zip code should not matter. Your race should not matter. So we really have to move the needle on health equity. And Jefferson is very committed to that. We've not, we just started a database. We're collecting 15 data points on social determinants of health on every patient that dons our door going forward. And we will start to impact that. Uh, I did that in my prior life at Ascension. We had 2 million people in our database. And we were actually starting to see the change in, in that. The, the number one social identified social determinant data Data, or identified social determinant in our database at Ascension was loneliness. And you can imagine how the pandemic fostered that loneliness. And so we are working, we, we put in places where we had group sessions for people who wanted to just socialize. We had a hotline if you were feeling isolated and just needed to talk to somebody. We put a lot of things in place that would help to mitigate some of those social determinants of health. So health equity You'll hear more and more about that. It's overused term today. It's just it's being under executed against, and we're committed again committed to making health equity a major part of where Jefferson is and how it shows up. There are lots of changing economics in healthcare today. Um, you know, the traditional model was if you came into the hospital and uh, and it needed a, uh, a hip operation, we did the hip operation. The doctor got paid a certain amount of money. The hospital got paid a certain amount of money. You may have a copay or deductible. That's all changing now. And it's changing. You know the n number one employer of physicians is today in the US? It's an insurance company. 
United Healthcare is the number one employer. They employ 60,000 doctors across the U.S. Um, our, the group I ran in, in uh, at Ascension, we had 10,000. We were the third largest medical group in the country. You know what was behind, in front of us? Two insurance companies were in front of us. Uh, so insurance companies are, that financing arm is now being tied to care delivery. And so for us, as we thought about, and my predecessors thought about, how do we can now compete with who are the real competition? It's not necessarily Penn and Temple that used to be the traditional. It's, there are so many disruptors, and insurance companies are increasingly becoming much more providers. And so they are much more challenged. So that's why Jefferson now has a health plan. There's been a lot of consolidation in the market, both on the provider and on the payer side, and there's a lot of disruptors. You've heard of the companies called ChenMed and Oak Street. These are groups of physicians that got together and were purchased by insurance companies. So Aetna bought Oak Street for two and a half billion dollars. Uh, crazy numbers, crazy numbers. And they don't play by the same rules that if Penn wanted to buy them, they have to can only spend a certain amount of money on buying doctors because they feel like the federal government feels like you're you're paying for referrals. So the financing arm in healthcare is changing very quickly. What's, what's that meant for healthcare organizations? Really, most storied healthcare organizations, Common Spirit, Providence, Mass General Brigham, Kaiser, Advent, you can see the brackets. Those are not good for those of you who are not in business school. They're not good. Brackets are not good. Uh, and they're losing lots of money. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I can tell you that in this community, the vast majority of health systems are losing money. Uh, and that is a continued challenge. These are non-for-profit. Some of you say, well, why, does, why do non-for-profits, well, they don't need to make a profit. No, non-for-profit healthcare is really a tax status. What this really means is that we don't, um, we, we don't have shares, we don't have, uh, we don't have stock equity or anything like that. But we also have certain rules. We have to take care of everybody. If anybody shows up on our emergency room door, whether they have the ability to pay or not, we still have to take care of them. And what the profits that we generate in healthcare organizations, which generally are around three, four percent is a good year for us, what they do is they help us reinvest in our hospitals. And so, you know, my friends that are on Wall Street tell me, well, Joe, you're crazy. You have a $10 billion budget and you, you're gonna make 1%? That's nuts. Nobody would do that. That's what healthcare is uh, in general, is you make very small margins on large amounts of dollars. You know, Penn's margin this year is maybe one and a half or two percent. Jefferson's right around break even. Um, every other health system in the, in the city is losing money right now. Um, so, you know, this, the financial headwinds are real. And uh, frankly, there's workforce reductions and the workforce challenges and uh, all of these things are making the headwinds very, very strong. And, you know, the investor community has taken its toll on us. Jefferson had a downgrade in its bonds last year or in, our, in, our, uh, in our bond rating. Um, I expect that 60% of healthcare organizations will receive a downgrade this year. Uh, we just happen to be early in the process, and so we got our downgrade. Uh, and what does that mean for you, those of you who don't understand? It means if we go borrow money, it costs us more money. The interest rate costs us more money. The cost of capital is more. Changing workforce, um, again, the STEM jobs, the computer science jobs, working at home, we talked about that. Um, we need healthcare, or, uh, we need people in healthcare that are committed to people, committed to social interaction, um, and have strong social emotional skills. We're gonna need that. Uh, healthcare is going to get to a crisis level. Today, the crisis is nursing, but the future, there's going to be a crisis in, in, on the physician side. We have short, enormous shortages in the dental field today. I was in Harrisburg, uh, dentists today. It, uh, I think right now what I saw a stat is that 20% of dentists in the state of Pennsylvania are going to retire in the next five years. That's a big, these are big numbers. Uh, and we're not, we're not generating enough. Um, there's also a requirement. It's hard. I want to say, you know, I still take board exams. And uh, it's, life, it's commitment to lifelong learning. Not that every, every field doesn't have that. But I, I take board exams every 10 years. I finally get to the point where, you know, 
Uh, some of my certifications are lifelong. Uh, but I'm getting to that point now where um, you know, it's important to me to continue to be board certified. Uh, but it is, it, is, it, it is something that you have to sit down. I don't just take it cold <laughs> because there's certain things that you do and you don't do. So maintaining certification. Technology has made our lives in a lot, lot, a lot of ways in healthcare easier and in some cases not so easy. The promise of the electronic health record was going to do all this stuff for healthcare. It was going to make transform healthcare. We got sold a bill of goods because it really hasn't. It's now starting to hit some of the things. Um, we have now better repositories of record uh, or of data, and data will help free us from a lot of the things that in the past. Your president is, has a background in epidemiology. Uh, he understands the importance of data and understands the importance of how you manage to data. And that's going to be increasingly more important uh, long term. And then lastly, universities are facing a big cliff. And uh, you, you, people in this room forgot more about education than I'll know in my lifetime. But we're facing a big cliff in 2026. Um, and uh, frankly, you know, Jefferson is committed to being more pro uh, professionally driven uh, in a, uh, university, really specifically. And right now, we're, we've, had a, we've had good success under our president, Mark Tikashinsky, um, and it has done quite well, and we've continued to grow our enrollment. But we face the same cliff that you all face here and that everybody's facing in 26, 2026, the demographics see a sharp decline in the number of college kids. So we're going to continue to have to re-engineer ourselves on the edu education side, and I, I'm sure uh, the, the group here is the same. The other thing that's a headwind in this, uh, in this community is the fact that Philadelphia is a poor, one of the poorest large cities in America. Um, you know, we put a, a stroke prevention center up uh, together with Temple and uh, Dr. Ken Frazier, who is a, was a former CEO of Merck, gave us a $5 million gift. And um, it was, it, this stroke prevention center is in North Philadelphia. It is, sits right between the two poorest zip codes in the United States, in North Philadelphia, not more than five miles from here. It's very important work that we need to do, but understand that this community is a very poor community and very challenged. Um, we have a population that is aging, and so the commercial rates that, for those that have commercial insurance are much better than Medicare or Medicaid. So that continues to be a challenge for the, uh, the people that function, the health systems that function in this area. And, you know, frankly, um, we're just, our demographics, this is not Austin, Texas. This is not Phoenix, Arizona, where there is growth and, ex and, and industry is moving. And so we, we, that is one of the other big challenges we have in this community yet. And violent crime continues to be a problem, and that, that is in every major city today. Um, Jefferson has become the largest health system in, in the area. Um, it's, um, you know, it's it, by, by acquisition. You know, we have uh, the merger of Abington and uh, Jefferson started that growth. And together, they have grown, uh, and we have now acquired Einstein and Aria and uh, Kennedy Health in New Jersey. Jefferson is a, uh, across southeast Pennsylvania and South Jersey is the largest health system uh, by a significant amount. And that's good in some ways. Uh, if I were building a business, uh, would I want to build a very large business in a place where it's hard to make money? Uh, I'm not sure the business school professors would say that's a great place to do that. But uh, we're here and we're part of this community and we're committed to this community, uh, not just for profit, but really to uh, improve the health of this community, improve lives. Um, uh, our health plan, just a little bit about that. Those of you who don't understand health plan, Medicaid is really the population non-65, 65 and below, that does not have access to commercial insurance. If they meet the income requirements, uh, they can get a state-funded plan called Medicaid. And what that does is um, it provides health care for them when they go into the hospital. Um, our health plan is predominantly Medicaid. We do have Medicare, which is the over 65, um, as part of that health plan. And we'll continue to grow that health plan. Turns out when you connect the provider arm, the provider arm with the financing arm, 
it becomes uh, a better financial model for the health system. And we now there, there's data on that that those health systems that own health care or health insurance plans actually do better long term. So when you think about leadership, and I will say your president probably can tell you the same thing, my job today is not being the smartest person in the room. My job is to hire people that are smarter than me to be in the room that I listen to. And um, as such, you know, we've gone through a, quite a bit of leadership transition uh, at Jefferson since, I've, since we've been here the last nine months. And I'm really excited. I have one of my bright, shining stars with me today, Dominique Kashmir. Um, and today, you know, we need to, our, 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 um, our leadership team should be a reflection of the community we live in. And so we're looking for a, a diverse uh, team that gives us the best chance to win games. I'm an old coach. I come from a family of coaches. And uh, we're always looking to win games. We're, my brothers, you tell me, they're all football coaches. They tell me, we're with you, win or tie. Uh, so we're not in this to lose. Uh, and, um, and so we, we are assembling a great team. Dr. Bally Yahia is uh, our president of healthcare. Dr. Or, uh, John Mordak is a, our new chief financial officer. He is uh, from, uh, he was a CFO at Duke, Duke Medicine. Uh, Mark Whalen, uh, Mark Whalen, talking about violence and stuff, Mark's our chief strategy officer. His first day in Philadelphia, he was walking back to his hotel and he was assaulted. Um, and so I said, well, are you coming back tomorrow? And he said, yeah, I'll be here. Uh, you have Dominique, and we, have, we just have a great team that we're pulling together, and we're really excited about it. But leadership, as you go on in leadership, you'll figure out that you're only as good as the team that's around you. Uh, and I'm just, uh, I can't emphasize that enough to young leaders, young people in the room, that you are in support of a team and team is how you're going to be the most successful. They, they say there's no I in team. That's right. Some, Michael Jordan used to say, yeah, but there's a me in team. So we don't hold to that. Um, uh, but uh, honestly, uh, this is an important part of our success going forward. Um, we also think that, you know, that, that COVID um, has really cr created a lot of the, the crisis around our universities. Um, and... Um, we had this conversation at lunch today with some of your professors about the changing demographics. How people, kids do not want to be in class anymore. Kids want to learn remotely. Um, I have a son that goes to Ohio State his freshman year. He's, half his classes were online. So uh, it's a challenge, and uh, I'll leave that to the education experts of what's the right mix of that. But it is just another factor as we think about Thomas Jefferson University and our educational program going forward. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have a university that has a, uh, it's very much a uh, research university. Uh, it has a lot of global partnerships. It has a lot of regional partnerships as well. Professions focused uh, university is where we focus. Uh, and we are really f uh, focusing on work orientation in our university. Um, and I would say that our university sports program, I think, do we play you all in Division Two? Do we play you in baseball and stuff? Should have probably knew that, but uh, I know our baseball team had a good year and our basketball team's had a good year this year, so maybe we'll have to have a friendly bet president if we play next year. So going forward um, for us, it's about optimizing our clinical program. It's about health plan growth and continuing to match the financing arm to our health system. It's about changing how we create a more value-based system, that value is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, we have to become more, much more consumer-focused, uh, and we have to have a university that's successful. The important part of that university is in support of a large health system uh, is the fact that the university last year graduated 450 nurses. 380 of them stayed in the Jefferson system. Very important for us. And so as we think about partnerships with Chestnut Hill uh, or Ch Chestnut Hill University is how can we partner together moving forward around nursing, around other allied health, around taking your best and brightest uh, students into our medical school. We're, we're looking for those partnerships with Chestnut Hill. Um, so last thing I would say is, you know, we're, we're a large organization. We're committed to this community. Uh, we want to deliver a you know, compelling value statement for our students, our patients, 
and our beneficiaries and our insurance plan, and we need to continue to do that. Uh, Jefferson has really grown uh, in many ways vertically, and um, meaning that we bought a bunch of health systems on the health side. We have a health plan, and we have a, um, we have a university that's grown by acquisition. We now need to, to think about this, and that's been growing horizontally across. But what we really need to now do is start to get past the vertical integration, but to start to think about horizontal integration moving forward as we connect those dots, because it's going to be increasingly more important that financing and healthcare delivery will do that, and it will be supported strongly, but not only by our medical school and our academic medicine institution, but also by an undergraduate university that is working on unique things in healthcare. And our university is really around partnerships today. We look, and I can tell you that it's a major, a major uh, agenda item for us is to think about partnerships. So I'm bullish on uh, Jefferson. I'm bullish on where we've been. Uh, the fact that our history has uh, allowed us to do so many great things over the course of our uh, 200 years. And we're looking forward to the next 200 years. And I thank you all for your attention. Appreciate everything that, uh, and congratulations on 30 years. And I'm humbled by the fact that I'm your 30th uh, anniversary speaker. And thank you to the president and to the board chair. I appreciate very much being here today and wish you all, you students, the best of luck and hopefully we'll see you in, in medical school at Jefferson if that's your desire. <laughs> so thank you all. Please come forward to the center of the aisle and ask questions. Don't be shy. Good afternoon, Dr. Cassian. Thank you so much for those amazing remarks. My name is Susan Apold, and I will be celebrating my two-month anniversary here at Chestnut Hill College tomorrow. So not nearly 30 years, but perhaps I'm on my way. I was touched by the history of your career and your um, your connection to the Philadelphia area, and so I'm going to ask you to indulge me for a minute. I am a registered nurse. I'm a board-certified adult geriatric nurse practitioner, and if we could speak to that lifelong learning thing for a minute, I have to take my boards on Friday afternoon again. Good luck with that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a little busy, so I don't know how it's going to turn out. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, and my connection to Jefferson is that I did my clinical rotation in gastroenterologic nursing, at the new Jefferson building when I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania. The new building had this fabulous atrium and I couldn't wait to get there because you had a great cafeteria. It is no longer the new building and I am no longer the woman I was when Florence Nightingale and I were studying at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I do want to tell you that from my perspective, you have hit all of the high points of what is happening in healthcare. I too have been in healthcare for a very, very long time and thought up until 2019 or 2020 that I had seen an epidemic. The first patient I saw who had HIV AIDS, I saw in the Thomas Jefferson University Intensive Care Unit in Philadelphia. I thought that was it. And then 2020 happened and things will never be the same. The most important point that you made from my perspective is that you talked about a sweet spot, my language, between the technology for which we are incredibly grateful and the touch for which we need to be incredibly grateful. I am so honored and excited to be part of Chestnut Hill College to put together a nursing program with my experience and my heart because both of those things need to be available to every patient in the world, not just the United States of America. Um, and I'm excited to hear you talk about partnerships because um, those 400 and some nurses that you graduated, I can help you. I can give you some more of the best trained, best educated registered nurses, at least in the Philadelphia area. Thank you. Appreciate that, thank you. Um, so, First of all, can you do something about the pollen as a doctor? No. Um, 
I had a question. You mentioned something about, um, you know, the genetic predisposition to certain disorders and such. And where do you see um, that going forward as far as being able to practice preventive care, but also dealing with insurance companies who perhaps would use that information against a patient's insurability? Yeah, that, that's a great question because, uh, candidly, right now, um, one of the biggest questions we have for those who are not scientific, but you might have the gene for something. So the genotypically positive person who does not have the phenotype means they don't have the disease. So they may have a gene that says you're going to get, you know, breast cancer, but you don't have breast cancer. So what do you do? Do you do bilateral mastectomies to prevent that uh, breast cancer from coming? Uh, and to, to the point where if we start doing screening on genetics, is an insurance company going to say, hey, we're not going we're not, we're not to insure Sally because we think there's a good chance she's going to get breast cancer? So we have to work a lot of that out yet, and I think there's going to need to be long, longitudinal studies, epidemiologic studies, to say, okay, in these genotypically positive patients, what's the predictive accuracy of, of exhibiting the disease and at what time frame, and what can we do to mitigate it? Because I think a lot of prevention will start to be that, right? We used to measure just cholesterol, right? Now what do we do? We measure... Um, not only do we measure cholesterol, we measure LDL and HDL. And now what do we do? Now we measure a thing called LP little a, and we measure, uh, we measure a genotype called D, the, D, the ACE genotype to see if you're genotype, genotypically positive. The treatment for that is different. And so we are now refining how we do prevention based on, pharma, based on genetic profiles. But there are a lot of things that have not been worked out yet, and I think uh, I, the, one of the biggest one of the biggest challenges we have in healthcare on the genetic side is the number of shortages in genetic counselors around the country. It's very difficult to have a successful gene program. What if they measure me and they say, "Hey, you know, you're likely to get an aneurysm," um, uh, and so were your children? You know, we have to have genetic counselors that can sort of work people through that. And it's a big disservice to do a gene, gene study on somebody and not have genetic counseling for them uh, on, the, on the back end. So appreciate the question. Thank you. Yes. Hello. My name is Fiona. I am a uh, junior in biology, well, with a biology major. And I want to go to medical school. So I know that you mentioned because of COVID that there's been a bunch of burnout with all the um, physicians and everything. I just didn't know if there was a specific area that lost a considerable amount of doctors and that you would recommend to a medical student to yeah. go into that area. Appreciate that. You know, honestly, I would tell you that um, the, the, the doctors that we lost the most of are uh, pulmonary and critical care. Uh, and the reason is, is the number of people that ended up in our intensive care units on respirators or not on respirators, but respiratory failure uh, was so enormous. Uh, I can remember seeing pictures. Uh, and these people, remember, we didn't let anybody in the hospital. That was a big mistake by us on the healthcare side. And we did it for the right reasons, but it was a bad, bad, unintended outcome. Many people died alone. And our nurses were shouldering that, holding people's hands at the time of, of at the end of their life. And um, so I, I would say critical care was the hardest hit. Um, my advice for young people that want to be, uh, go to medical school, is do really well in your undergraduate studies. Uh, do well in your MCATs. You'll learn much more about what fits you better as you get into medical school and you start to do rotations. You're just starting your rotations. You're going to be ex exposed to a number of different things. Um, I, I would say keep your eyes wide open um, and, uh, and, and follow your passion. You'll, you'll figure it out. Um, it, it, you'll have a day where you say, this is what I want to do. And, uh, you know, um, it, uh, it's still, as I say, the most rewarding field um, that, for me, I, I encourage kids, to, young people, to go into, into uh, medicine. I think it's, uh, it, is a, it is a calling, it's a profession, 
and I hope it continues to be that, not necessarily just a job. So thank you and good luck. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, again, thank you. Um, I don't want to forestall whatever happy hour might be in, in the uh, offing. <laughs> and uh, thank you again. And uh, Lakshmi, thank you so much for your 30 years of commitment and um, allowing me the honor of being your 30-year speaker. And I wish you well in all your future endeavors. And uh, people told me, what is it? Well, money? Is it money? Goddess of wealth. That's what the name means. Goddess, God, goddess of wealth. So, and you bring much more than monetary wealth to the program. So thank, thank you, you very Dr. much. Thank you, Dr. Kashon. And then I cannot thank you enough for coming here. Thank you for making this 30th anniversary a memorable one, Dr. Kashon. Your time topic was timely and everybody has to hear it and everyone has to know it. And I cannot, I could not have asked for any other person than taking this coveted spot. And I'm so grateful for your time and also thank Dr. Charlie Yeo for bringing you here. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.